Shalom Aleichem to everyone. Today's show is being especially recorded for our viewers. Um, Be'ezat Hashem, we're going to be learning about Parashat Shavua, Parashat Re'eh, with a lot of very important subjects to discuss. Shem Hashem Na'asev and Hatzliach, learning for the Hatzlacha of all of Am Yisrael, Be'ezat Hashem. So a beautiful, beautiful Midrash that talks about the concept of giving tzedakah. This week's parasha is loaded with the mitzvah of tzedakah, Baruch Hashem. The Torah not only mentions it once, but twice, and again, and again, it comes up many, many times. For example, Perek Tetvav, uh, Psukim Zayin through Yud. <clears throat> Let's learn it together. When you have a poor man, one of your brothers, in one of your in gates in your land, that Hashem is giving you, do not hold back your heart, do not close up your hand from your fellow brother, you shall open up your hand to him, and you shall lend him whatever he needs, Whatever it is that he's lacking, you shall lend it to him. <clears throat> As you know, this year in Israel is the Shemitah year, and a person might think to himself, says the Torah, that since the rule is that any loan that's supposed to be paid up uh, by Shemitah is going to get canceled by the Shemitah, so therefore, don't lend him the money because it'll get canceled. You're, you'll become cheap with your fellow brother. You're not going to give him that loan that he needs. And he will call out to Hashem and there will be a sin upon you. Give, you shall surely give. And your heart should not feel bad when you give him. Because of this matter, Hashem will bless you in every aspect, in everything you do, whatever you send your hand towards, Hashem will bless you. Open up, you shall surely open up. Give, you shall surely give. Lend, you shall surely lend him. Torah, not only says it many times, but it uses a double language. In other words, don't mess this up. You have a very special mitzvah to go ahead and to give this person. Now, the Gemara in Masechet Baba Metziah goes on to say how important it is to do this. It talks about it in many different places, why there's a double language over here. Uh, it, could be, it could be because of the fact that the person might not want it uh, as a gift, he might want it as a loan. Give it to him as a loan. It could be the guy comes back and asks you many, many times. Give it to him again and again. It's double language to tell you that this is the most up, utmost important thing that you have to do. And the key is to remember that because of you doing this, you will be blessed. Whatever it is that you're going to give is going to come right back to you. As the Halakha and Shulchan tells you, that a person will never become poor by giving tzedakah. It simply will never happen. So important for us to remember that the giving is the getting as well. Famously, we know Vinatinu, the Vilna Gon points out when, when we talk about the giving of the donations to the Beta Mikdash, the Mishkan, Vinatinu, they shall give is a palindrome that you can read in both directions because what you give is what you're going to get as well. Vinatinu, you can read it in both ways. Same words. Same thing when it comes to Zuz, which means, which is the classical Talmudic uh, form of money, Zuz says, uh, say the Mepharshim that Zuz also can be read in both directions because again, when a person gives his money to tzedakah, to charity, then he is going to receive as well. He's going to get it right back. Famously in this week's parasha as well, again, this parasha is loaded, loaded, loaded with the mitzvah of tzedakah. So important for us to be aware of this. Famously, the, the parasha tells us, Aser ta'aser et kol There's a mitzvah for us to give 10% of all our grains uh, to the Levim. In a, in a nutshell, when a person grows grains, so he has a special mitzvah that he has to give 2% to the Kohen. Uh, that's The average is 
so if let's say he grew a hundred grains, so two of them are going to go to the Kohen first and he's got leftover. So he's got 10% that has to go to the Levi, um, which is uh, called Maaser Yishon. So that would be 9.8 of whatever he's, uh, whatever he's giving. It could be grains, it could be wine, it could be barrels of oil, olive oil. So he has to give that as well to the, um, to the Levi. Then whatever he's got left, he has to give 10% uh, to, uh, he has to separate 10% of it and take it to Yerushalayim Hira Kodesh and eat in the, within the walls of the old city uh, any of these uh, things that he has to separate Maaser Shani from. Now, if that's difficult for him because Baruch Hashem, he's very, uh, he's very well to do and he's got a lot of Maaser Shani, he can redeem the Kedusha off of it and he can put it on coins. And he takes the coins and he spends them in the old city and he can buy whatever he wants with it. Um, it, could be, it could be meat, it could be grains, it could be any kinds of things that he's interested in eating in the old city, and he can eat it over there. Now, famously, Chazal tell us, Aser aser et kol So you have to tithe, you shall surely tithe. Give 10%, you shall surely give 10% of what you have to the Levi. Now, fam- uh, famously, Chazal say, Aser bishvil shetit asher. Why the double language? Give 10%, you shall surely give 10%. Because Aser, give 10% is also the same root as Osher, which means wealth. And therefore, if you give 10%, you will become wealthy, explain the rabbis. Now, it's very important to be aware of the reason for this. I heard from my Rashid, Rabbi Ben Oliel Shlita. I also saw this quoted in the name of Rabbi Shimon Shkop in the uh, beginning of Shari Yosher. He says that the idea is very simple that a Kadosh Baruch Hu gives a person a certain responsibility that he's supposed to do in life. He's supposed to go ahead and he's supposed to use what Hashem gives him for the service of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Every person is given certain things. Uh, in this case, we're talking about somebody who was given money and he's given extra money, in this case, uh, grains or extra grains, and he's therefore able to give it away to those who need. You have to remember, who's the person who's receiving Maaser Yishon? That's the Levi. The Levi is somebody that does not have a portion of land in, in the land of Israel. Uh, the, all the tribes received an, an inheritance when they came into the land of Israel, that there was a land divided up, given to each tribe and each family. The tribe of Levi did not get that. They don't have any particular land. They, were, they are settling in the, uh, in the cities of refuge, and uh, they are not... Uh, they were not given a specific portion because Hashem is their portion. That's what it says in the Torah. So over here, we have this, um, this individual who's a Levi, who doesn't have a field. He doesn't have uh, a portion of land. So you're helping him out. He has a special place in the Jewish nation, and we have a mitzvah to help him and to support him. So when you do so, when you go ahead and do what's right, Hashem has entrusted you with this land, with this ability to support this uh, individual, whether it's the Kohen from the tribe of Levi or the non-Kohanim, the regular Leviim from the tribe of Levi, Hashem has given you a job, which is to support them, to take them on your shoulders and to help out. When you've got whatever amount of grains you have, you got to give them that 10%. So when you show HaKadosh Baruch Hu, look, I understand that everything that you've given me is not for me only. It's for, it's for others. You've entrusted me. You've made me the agent to give what's rightfully supposed to go to them, to them. So I'm just your messenger. I'm just your emissary. And I have a job to do. And therefore, uh, a person who shows HaKadosh Baruch that he's responsible with that job that he was entrusted with, Hashem says, Baruch Hashem, he's doing the right thing. So therefore, uh, I have to give him more responsibility. I can, I can trust him. I can show. I see that he is showing responsibility. He's doing the right thing with it. And therefore, I can give him more responsibility. Therefore, aser te aser means tithe, give 10%, bishvil shetit asher, in order that you should become wealthy, meaning because by doing this, you show responsibility to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and therefore, Hashem gives you more responsibility. Now, it's important to be aware that this is not only related to money. This is related to any gift that Hashem has bestowed upon an individual. Like uh, the famous story about Navot. Navot was a man that had a vineyard. And Navot's vineyard was uh, desired by King Ahab. It was his ancestral heritage. And he 
And uh, King Ahav wanted it. He wanted, he offered to buy it. And Navot said, I'm not selling it. It's my ancestral heritage. King Ahav said, it doesn't make a difference. Uh, I want to buy it. And he says, no, I'm not interested. I'm not selling. And King Ahav was very upset. He went home and Izevel, his wife, saw that he was very upset. He was distraught. She said, what's going on? What's the matter? And he told her, I want to buy Ahav's vineyard. I want to buy Navot's vineyard and he's not selling. She said, that's the problem. No issue. She went, she hired two false witnesses to go testify about Navot, that he's rebelling against the king. And they testified in court, at which point the court gave down the verdict that he's rebelling against the king and therefore he's supposed to be put to death. They killed him. And then they took over his vineyard, at which point when, when uh, King Ahav was in the vineyard of Navot, so Eliyahu Navi came and told him, did you uh, kill and also inherit? That's a terrible, heinous crime. You're therefore going to lose the kingdom. And Ahav did a little bit of repenting. Uh, he wore sackcloth. He fasted for three days. Hashem said because of his teshuvah, although partial, uh, he still is going to uh, be rewarded that he's not going to lose the kingdom in his lifetime, but rather it'll be that his children lose the kingdom. Be it as it may, the point is that Navot lost his life uh, uh, because of not selling the vineyard. Now, you see, that's a very unjust thing. You, know, you have to ask yourself, well, why did Navot deserve to die? What happened? So the Midrashim tell us a very interesting thing about Navot. And that is that Navot had a beautiful voice. And Navot, every one of the three festivals, when the whole Jewish nation would go up to Yerushalayim or Kodesh to partake in the three festivals, Navot would go ahead and would, uh, and would lead the, the tefillot, he would lead the prayers. And Navot's voice was beautiful, and everyone would come to hear him, and it was a very elevating uh, spiritual experience when they would hear Navot. Now, this one of the three festivals, Navot decided not to go. He decided that he was maybe a little bit concerned with his vineyard, and uh, he didn't want to leave it uh, you know, unprotected, and then whatever happened, happened. So it turns out that by him, not giving the honor to Hashem with his voice, uh, with, his, with his beautiful voice that he was able to uplift everyone spiritually by him deciding to be more concerned about his vineyard uh, and to stay back from the three festivals that actually caused him to lose his vineyard. And, uh, and, and the idea being that HaKadosh Baruch Hu tells Navot, although it might not have been directly with a warning and a voice coming out of heaven, but HaKadosh Baruch Hu over here is telling us, look, Navot, you had a job. Your job was that I entrusted you with a beautiful, beautiful voice and the power of music and melody to uplift everyone spiritually. And you had been doing your job beautifully for quite some time, but now it seems that you have decided that you no longer want to do your job. So you're basically denying the job that I'm giving you. So Hashem says in that case, that there's no more purpose to the person's existence because that was his reason that he was around, which is a very... Uh, scary thought if you think about it because none of us really know or even if we do uh, it, it's a hard thing to, um, to to absorb that concept that it's possible for somebody with his own hands to put an end to his life so to say uh, by simply rejecting an obligation that, he's, that he has uh, in the eyes of Hashem that he's supposed to accomplish and he's deciding that he doesn't want to do it anymore but that's the idea but HaKadosh Baruch Hu uh, decides who to entrust with what. And in the event that the person is misusing it or he's not doing the right thing with it, so Hashem says, okay, I, gotta, I have to give it to somebody else because this has to get done. This poor Levi is supposed to get his ma'asir. He's going to get it one way or another. The question is, do you want to be the one that I entrust with the job of doing this? And if not, then no. I, I heard from Rabbi Ben Porat Shlita in Eretz Israel. He says that there was a group of men that came to the great Gaon Harav, Aaron Leib Steinman, Zecher Tzadik Livracha, right after 2008, after the big crash, uh, when the market just collapsed and everything was going bad and people lost a ton of money. I know people that unfortunately had uh, suffered you know, a heart attack. I mean, it's crazy, crazy things what happened at that time. And a group of very wealthy American Jewish businessmen uh, decided to seek counsel from the great Golador of Aaron Leib Steinman, Zatzal. And uh, they went to him and they told him that, you know, collectively and you know, personally as well, each one got up and said, we lost hundreds of millions of dollars. 
a group of American Jewish businessmen, they all went, they said, we lost hundreds of millions of dollars in this, in this market crash. And we don't know what to do. We want to understand from HaKadosh Baruch Hu what's going on. So Rabbi Aaron Leib Steinman looked at them and he didn't have any two ways about it. By him, you know, he was somebody that was so, um, so devoted to Torah and had absolutely no, nothing from this world. I went to his home once and I saw him. He was learning Torah in his bed. He had a little table in front of him. His home was very small, just a nice room for the books. But I mean, everything it was absolutely all holy, all pure, nothing, no self-interest whatsoever, just all devoted to Hashem, all devoted to Torah. And um, he was a very righteous man. The whole world stood on this man's shoulders and he, he barely had anything in his own house. A very, very amazing person. Lived over a hundred years, a big tzaddik. At any rate, Rav Leib Steinman didn't owe anybody anything and didn't need to be concerned with anything. He told them straight up. He said, guys, you told me that you lost hundreds of millions of, millions of dollars, correct? They said, yes, it's true. So he says, okay, that means that before you lost the hundreds of millions of dollars, so that means that you had hundreds of millions of dollars, correct? Yes, true, okay, very good. So that means that if you were... If you were in possession of hundreds of millions of dollars, that means that you earned hundreds of millions of dollars. Correct? Yes. Okay, good. So he says, so let me ask you something. There's a mitzvah called ma'asir. Ma'asir means to give 10%. So here you are. You're telling me you lost hundreds of millions of dollars. It means you had earned them at some point. Let me ask you something. Did you give 10% of those hundreds of millions of dollars? Did you give ma'asir? That means that you give tens of millions of dollars to tzedakah? So they all were silent and they weren't able to answer him. He says, you see, that's the problem. HaGadosh Baruch Hu entrusts you with this money. HaGadosh Baruch Hu says, I'm giving you hundreds of millions of dollars. I'm expecting you to give the tens of millions of dollars to tzedakah. That's the maser that you're supposed to do. This money isn't just for you and your family. It's not just for you, your family, your grandkids, your great grandkids. No, it's supposed to be given over to the right people. It's, a, it's entrusted with you to be dished out to whoever is supposed to receive it. And that's the mitzvah of ma'aser that we're talking about right now. So you decided that you don't want the job. So Hashem says, these people that are supposed to receive this money are supposed to receive it. They're going to receive it one way or another. But you decided that you don't want it to be yourselves who dish it out. You want it to be other people. Okay, so no problem. So I take it away from you. I give it to other people and they will be responsible enough to dish it out. This is a very important lesson that we have to understand. You see, the parasha over here tells us, and this is something which is so, so, so important. I'm, I'm going to read you, I'm going to read you a midrash, uh, which is really beautiful about this exact subject. But before we even get there, it says over here beautifully in, in Rashi, it says that you have to, you should not withhold, you should not close your hand. Do not close your hand from your destitute brother. Don't, don't squeeze that hand shut. Make sure it's open that you should give him. Why? Says Rashi, what, are the, what is the word of the Torah? From your brother, the destitute. Says Rashi, a strong and powerful message. If you do not give him, you will eventually be the brother of the poor person, meaning that you'll be just like him. You'll eventually come to need it yourself, God forbid. Why is this the case? Because again, it's exactly what Reb Leib Steinman Zatzal told these wealthy men. He told them, gentlemen, HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave us the money not just to keep for ourselves. HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave it to us in order to give to others. You have that extra, you have to give. You can't just keep it all for yourself. Rabotai, Rabbi Steinman that's how talk the talk, but also walk the walk. I heard a story about him. Unbelievable. Rabbi Steinman that's how, uh, after he passed away, they asked his wife, um, did you ever see your husband, the great Sadiq, ever get angry? Did you ever see him get mad? So she said, my husband, Allah Bashlam, never, ever got mad, got angry, raised his voice. Nothing, nothing ever. 
She said there was one time that he really got mad. And they asked him, they asked her, when was that? So she said, I'll tell you. What happened was like this. We needed some new marble in the kitchen. There was a crack or some, something that uh, the counter needed to be fixed up a little bit. I saw that there was a sale with marble uh, at one of the local stores here in B'nai Brak. And you could get a nice big slab of marble that they could install for you. It was a pretty good deal on sale. 300 shekel. This was, I don't know how many years ago. 300 shekel, you get the new slab of marble, they install it for you, you have a new kitchen counter, beautiful. So he comes home one day after a long day of learning and he sees that there's this new kitchen counter and he says to his wife, where did this come from? So, he's, so she told him, well, there was a sale, we needed a new kitchen counter and uh, this was uh, something that... Uh, you know, that I got for the kitchen. So he says to her, wait a second, you had extra money, um, an extra 300 shekel, right? This, this wasn't like, like uh, something that we really, I mean, we were able to survive without it, right? Technically we're okay. Yeah, so you had an extra 300 shekel. And instead of using your extra 300 shekels to give to tzedakah, you spent it on a piece of marble? He said, she said that when that happened, Rabbi Leib Steinman was walking around, pacing the house for hours, saying, what am I going to tell HaKadosh Baruch Hu? I had an extra 300 shekel, and instead of giving it to tzedakah, I spent it on a stone. I could have got Olam Haba with this money, and instead I spent it on a stone. And he was back and forth, back and forth for a long time. What am I going to tell Hashem? What am I going to say? I had, an extra, I had extra money. And I didn't give it to Tzedakah. I gave it to the store for, for some stone, for, for marble. And it was back and forth. Abotai, this man wanted nothing for himself. Zero. Nothing. If I have extra in his mind automatically, it's for, it's for others. It's for Tzedakah. When do we see people like that? It's once in a generation. It's a tremendous, tremendous level. But my point is, that a person needs to understand, at the very least, maybe we're not on the level that every little shekel that we have extra, we feel like we have to give it away. But at the very least, like Elosh Baruch Hu gives us some general guidelines. Maaser, 10%, of course, always bli neder. We could do that. It's possible to do that and to be on top of it. And, you know, you think that you see, you think that the idea of tzedakah is only where it's explicit. Abutai, the parasha comes again to teach us this message of, of tzedakah. I'll read to you the pasuk inside. This is actually earlier in the parasha. Perek Yud Dalet, pasuk chaf. This is quite amazing. Again, we're going back to our good old friend, the Levi. Uh, I'm sorry, Perek Yud Bet, pasuk chaf. The Levi, one more time. Uh, pasuk Yud Tet, Yud Bet, Yud, yud Tet. Hishamer Lecha, the Torah tells us, be very careful. Penta Azov et Levi. Be very careful, lest you leave the Levi on your, on your, uh, all your days while he's on the ground, on, on, uh, on, the, on the land. You can't leave the Levi alone. You have to be there for him. You have to support him. You have to make sure he has what he needs. Says Rashi, this is what the Torah is telling us. Let's say that you've exhausted all your... Maaser Yishon, you've, you've given it all away. So the 10% that's supposed to go from your produce to the Levi, you already gave it away. Okay, it, it's gone. So now you don't have what to give it. So we know there's another option. In years number three and six of the Shemitah cycle, there's something called Maaser Ani. So think of it this way. Maaser Sheni, which is in years number one, two, four, and five, which is the second tithing that you're supposed to separate, like we mentioned earlier. You're supposed to separate 10% of what you've got and take it up to Yerushalayim, Yerak Kodesh, and uh, eat it over there. So that's only in years one, two, four, and five. In years number three and six, so then you don't do that, but rather you separate that 10%, and instead of taking it to Yerushalayim, you give it to poor people. So says Rashi, in years number three and six, so you might not have exhausted, let's say, your 10% to the Levi, but you can give him the second 10% to 
which is Maser Ani, the Maser for the poor people. And the Levi falls into that category because he doesn't have a field. He doesn't have a way of sustaining himself. Says Rashi, so tell him Maser Ani, give him from the second time in. Says Rashi, what happens if that's not an option either? So then, En Lecha Maser Ani, you don't have Maser Ani, Hazminehu Al Shlamecha, bring him to your peace offering meal. Sometimes a person can bring a peace offering, which is an animal sacrifice that he brings to the temple, and he and his family consume that animal, says the Mishnah. So that means that now you have an opportunity to bring the Levi to that meal. That's something that we can all do, Rabotai. We can invite them over. We can bring them. You might not have necessarily extra cash, but you can bring them over. You can have them at a meal. That's something which is huge. Says Rashi, do that. You can't give him Maser Rishon, give him Maser Ani. You can't give him Maser Ani, invite him to the Korban Shlamim, invite him to the meal that you're going to have with your family uh, with, this, with this meat. Bring him there, give him that way. Says the Midrash, look at the next words that come up in the Torah. Ki yarchiv Hashem elokecha et gibulcha ka'asher diber lach, ve'amarta ochla basar, ki te'ave nafshecha lechol basar, when Hashem will increase your borders, like Hashem promised you, and you'll say, I want to eat meat because your, your soul desires to eat meat. You can eat meat, meaning like this. Until this verse in the Torah, just the simple understanding first, but then the chidush. The simple understanding is that until now, until this verse in the Torah, it's, it was forbidden for a person to have a barbecue. You can't just barbecue meat. You can't just cook meat. You have to bring it as a sacrifice in the temple. In order to eat meat, it has to be sacrificial meat. Otherwise, it would be a very grave sin. Comes along the Pasuk now and tells us, yeah, but you know what? You're going to be in a place, Baruch Hashem, now in Israel, where you're not close to the encampment of the Mishkan. One guy is going to be in, in Jerusalem, but another guy is going to be in Haifa. Another guy is going to be in Be'er Sheva. Another guy is going to be in Tel Aviv, Petach Tikva. So it's a little bit of a distance, and there are no vehicles to get you there. So you can't. So you can't go up. It's not going to be easy for you to eat meat. Says the Torah, Dusha, it's okay. From this point and on, you don't have to bring a sacrifice in order to eat meat. You can eat meat, even just for the sake of eating meat, wherever you are, in uh, Tel Aviv, in Haifa, even though it's not for the purposes of a sacrifice. But notice what happened. Notice that this idea that Hashem is expanding your borders Ki archiv Hashem et givulecha. Hashem is increasing you. Hashem is making you bigger. Hashem is making you more successful. When does this come? Because you supported the Levi. You took care of that Levi. You helped him out. You didn't have Maser Yishon. You gave him Maser Ani. You didn't have any more Maser Ani left either. You brought him to your table and you helped him. Says Hashem, you're going out of your way to help this fellow. Ki archiv Hashem et givulecha. Hashem will increase your borders. That's a very important thing for us to understand. That's why, Rabotai, very important uh, Midrash that I saw over here, beautiful. The Midrash tells us that, uh, this is the Midrash Shabbat in, in Bamidbar, Parashat Daled uh, um, Chet. It says the following, there's a story about Rabbi Eliezer and Rabbi Yeshua who used to go around collecting for needy Torah scholars. There was one guy that always would give them they went to a city called Antioch. This fellow's name was Abba Yudan. Abba Yudan always gave them. And unfortunately, Abba Yudan hit some tough times. Financially, he wasn't doing well this time around. They came and they were looking for him. And he, he, he was hiding. He hid in his house for two days. So I said to him, why are, you, why are you not going to work? Why are you not going down to the market? What's the story? Why are you at home hiding? He said, because the great rabbis, Rabbi Eliezer, Rabbi Yeshua, they came here. And uh, they're looking, you know, to collect money for the needy Torah scholars. I don't have what to give them. And I'm ashamed. I'm embarrassed. So I'm hiding up here. So his wife was a real Eshet Chayel, real Tzedeket. And she told Abba Yudan, listen, we have a field left, right? She's, he said, yes, we have a field. He says, listen, why don't you go? She told him, why don't you go sell half the field? Give the proceeds of that money, right? Of that sale to the, to the two rabbis that are here collecting. And you work with the other half of the field. So he said, okay, if you're okay with that, I'm going to do it. He sold half his field, took the money, ran after these two rabbis, and gave them the money for the poor Torah scholars. Now he told them, listen, I want you to know, this is not easy for me right now to give you this money. 
but you know, I, I'm asking you, please just pray for me. Pray for me that I should be successful. They told him, Hamakom Yemale Chesron Cha. Hashem should fill in whatever void you have, whatever you're lacking, Hashem should take care of it. So he went to work in the other half of his field that he had that he had left, and he was plowing. And as he was plowing the field, he hit something. And he didn't know what it was. He took it out and he ended up finding a tremendous treasure that made him much richer than he was even at his greatest peak. So they came back the following year to Antioch, Rabbi Eliezer and Rabbi Yeshua, and they were looking for Abba Yudan. So people told him, you want to have a meeting with Abba Yudan? Do you know what you're asking for? It's easier to get a meeting with the king than to meet with Abba Yudan. He blew up so much that he was so wealthy that nobody could even get through to him. He was huge. And eventually uh, they said, listen, you know, we, we do need to meet with him uh, because you know, if he would find out that we're here and, and we didn't come to see him, you know, he would be very upset because we know that he wants to give all this. Eventually they, they made a little bit of noise and people uh, got the word to him that these two rabbis are there collecting. So, what happened was that Abba Yudan heard about it. They, uh, he, he found, he made his way to them and, and uh, he told them, your prayer made fruit, right? Astat filatchem perot. Your prayer produced a lot of fruit. Look, Baruch Hashem, I'm doing very well now. It's all thanks to your tfilot. So they said to him, yeah, but we knew what you did in order to help out the Talmidei Chachamim. We know the kind of person that you are and the great deeds that you did. And that's why HaKadosh Baruch Hu is blessing you with all of these wonderful blessings. It's very important to be aware of that, that this is something that brings that. That's exactly what the Midrash tells us in this Pasuk. You helped out the Levi, ki archiv Hashem et givulecha, that Hashem will increase your borders. Very important. That's why, this I heard a beautiful pshat from, I forgot who he was quoting from. This is from Rabbi Moshe Meir Weiss. He says the following. He says that, aser te aser, the Pasuk tells us, give 10%, you shall surely give 10%. So he says, take the, take, it, it could be read the following, aser, take 10% of the word te aser, which means to give 10%. So let's do it. He says, tough is 400 in gematria. Take 10% of that, that's 40. What is 40 in gematria? Men. He says, ayin is 70. 70 in gematria, I'm sorry, 70, 10% of 70 is seven. That would make the letter Zayn. Then you've got Sin. Sin is 300. 10% of 300 is 30. That would give you the letter Lamet. Then you've got Reish, which is 200. And 10% of 200 is 20. And that would give you Chaf. So you're left with Mem, Zayn, Lamed, Chaf. 10% of that word is Mem, Zayn, Lamed, Chaf, which is the word Mazal, Cha. Your Mazal. You want to know what your Mazal depends on? Whether or not you're going to soar and succeed sky high, skyrocketing, what does your mazal depend on? Te'aser. Give that 10%. Make sure that you're doing it. And that way, HaKadosh Baruch Hu will help you to skyrocket B'ezad Hashem in the, word, in, the, in the world. And you should be able to continue B'ezad Hashem to give and give and give because Hashem will make you a channel of blessing through which all the bracha flows out to everywhere else B'ezad Hashem. Very important to be aware of that. Now, I wanted to mention a couple of more points that I think are very important to talk about in the parasha. First of all, uh, you should know that we spoke about the idea that there's a concept of ma'aser sheni. This, if you look in Perek Yudalid, Pasuk Chaf Gimel, Perek Yudalid, Pasuk Chaf Gimel says the following. I read to you inside. So you shall eat your ma'aser sheni within the walls of the old city and the place where Hashem chooses to uh, rest his name. The grains, the 10%, the, the second 10% of your grains, of your wine, of your oil, uh, the firstborn animals of your of your cattle and of your sheep, uh, you have to eat all of them in the old city, being close to Bet Hamikdash. Why? Says the mission. Says the uh, pasuk in the Torah. Leman tilmad liyirat Hashem elokecha 
kol hayamim, in order that you should learn to fear Hashem, your God, all your days. Question over here is, what exactly does that mean? I'm going to the old city of Yerushalayim to eat all of this maaser shani. Like we mentioned earlier, you take that 10 the second 10% up to Yerushalayim to eat it over there, and this causes me to have fear of Hashem. So it explains the Seforno, very important. The Seforno, I'm sorry, the Rashbam. Rashbam says, Keshetir'e makom shechina v'koanim ba'avodatam ulviim beduchanam v'yisrael b'ma'amadam. When you see the, the, the place of the shechina, the divine presence, you see the koanim doing their, their work, you see the leviim doing their service of the temple, you see the Jewish people that are there singing the praises of the Kadosh Baruch Hu at the temple. In other words, you see this grand uh, scene of, of, of kedusha, of holiness, of purity, that will bring upon you fear of Hashem. When you see the representatives of God, you see over there in Bet HaMikdash, you see the Sanhedrin. You're close to the Gedolei Hado, the greatest rabbis of the country, of the generation, of the entire world. You see them over there, you're going to gain tremendously. When you see the 10 miracles that are happening in the Bet HaMikdash, you see that there are tremendous miracles taking place on a daily basis. You've got the rain pouring down uh, on, the, uh, on, on, on the fire and it's not getting put out. You have miracle after miracle taking place. Then you'll see, uh, the, you'll see the Kedusha, you'll see the holiness, you'll see that Hashem is in control of everything. You'll fear Hashem. It will bring about fear of Hashem to you. When you see those tzaddikim that are walking around over there, you, you, it, it, it leaves an everlasting imprint on you. It says in the Gemara Masechet Eruvin, Daf Yud Gimel, that Rebbe, the great Rebbe Yudah Nasi, said that he attributes his incredible sharpness that he had in his learning and his studies to the fact that at one point in his life, he saw the back of Rabbi Meir Balanes. He only saw his back, like his neck. That's all he saw. He says, because I saw that, he attributes his sharpness in learning to that. He says, if I would have seen his front, if I would have seen his face, I would have been, been even much greater than what I am today, which is an amazing statement. He says, that's what the, that's what the Pasuk means when it says, that your eyes should see your teachers. The idea being that when you see them, when you're close to them, of course, there's no question that when you see them, you're, you gain more by understanding, like the Marsha says, their movements, their, their, their facial expressions, the way that they talk with their hands, you have a better understanding of what's going on. But even more so, by being connected to them, by being attached to them, by being close to them, that's the greatest sgula to get your hachamayim, to have fear of Hashem. So says the Torah Kedusha, we have to get you to the Bet HaMikdash. We need you to be close. We need you to take your 10%, your second 10%, Maser Shani, and take that and eat that in the old city and be close to the Tzadikim and be close to Bet HaMikdash. We have to make sure that you're there and that you're close because that way, that'll, leave the, that'll have such a profound effect on you. That's why you have to go every three festivals like we were talking about before with Navot. You have to make sure that you're there every one of those festivals in order to get that incredible infusion of spirituality into yourself, to get that Kedusha into your life. That's why it's so important to always be around the right place, to be there and to see everyone there, to seeing everyone worshiping at Kadosh Baruch Hu and getting closer to Kadosh Baruch Hu, to be close to the Kedusha. That's what helps the person to be strong in his Avodat Hashem, be around the Tzadikim. That's why it was such a great mitzvah when Elkanah, the husband of Hana, would go around to, on the three festivals. Before the three festivals, he would go around different cities. As they say in an Israel, there's an expression, Yerushalayim, Tel Aviv, Yerushalayim, Del Chefa. Tel Aviv and Yerushalayim is maybe an hour away from each other. But to go to Yerushalayim from Tel Aviv through Haifa is absurd because why would you do that? You're going totally out of your way to get to Yerushalayim. That's what Elkanah used to do. Elkanah used to walk around and go through all these different cities and encourage people to go up to the Beit HaMikdash for the three festivals because he knew how powerful of an impact it would have on them. And it was a great zikhut. He was Mezakeh Rabim. He was somebody that encouraged the public to do things that would bring them closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. It's a very high level. That's why he merited to have 
a son like Shmuel Navi, who was the ultimate Mezakeh Rabbi, who, 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 who led the whole Klal Yisrael on the path of Torah and Mitzvot. And that's why it was such a grave sin when you had Yerovam ben Nevat stopping people from going up uh, to, the, to the Bet Mikdash on the three festivals, preventing them and redirecting them towards idol worship. Chalila Vachas. That's why it says he doesn't have a portion in the world to come, which is very, very scary. So it's a very important idea that we should always be close to the tzaddikim. We should invite them over. We should bring them to our homes. We should learn from them as much as we can. And we should do whatever we can to increase the, the, the intake of kedusha that, uh, that we need so desperately, which unfortunately we don't have access to the Bet Mikdash nowadays to get all of that. But we could access the Tamidei Chachamim, the tzaddikim, and learn from their ways and bring it closer. I want to leave off with one final thought on the parasha, very important to, to be aware of. Uh, this, is, this has to do with the need to understand and be aware of the Torah Shebaal Peh, the oral Torah. There were many people throughout the history, the Tzdokim, the Baitusim, the Karaim, many people that denied the oral Torah. We believe firmly that without the oral Torah, we would never understand the written Torah. Now, why am I talking about it in this week's parasha? And by the way, to the, the Rambam writes in his 13 Principles of Faith that if somebody denies the oral Torah, he's denying the whole Torah. He's considered a kofer that doesn't have a share in the world to come. It's very grave. So when you hear people make statements like, oh, the rabbis, they said this, the rabbis said that, God forbid, Khalil of Achaz, reject it immediately because the rabbis are the transmitters of the Torah. Without those rabbis that transmitted the understanding of the Torah today, we would not know anything about what the Torah wants from us, what Hashem wants from us. For example, what it says in this week's parasha, it says in the parasha that when you have uh, an animal that you need to slaughter, Hashem says that you shall slaughter from your cattle and from your sheep, right? Says Moshe Rabbeinu, Kasher tziviticha, like I commanded you. Moshe is saying, HaKadosh Mechu told me to, that we have to slaughter the animals like he told us to, like he commanded us to. And it's amazing that you will never find in the entire Torah one halakha about how to slaughter an animal. There are five primary halakhot about slaughtering an animal. You cannot delay the slaughter. You have to do it properly in the right amount of time. You have to make sure not to uproot and tear, but rather to slice. You can't chop but rather it has to be a slicing motion. It cannot be covered. It has to be revealed when you cut with the knife. And it has to be in the right section. It cannot be too high. It cannot be too low. All of these five halachot of shechita, not even one of them is mentioned in the entire Torah Dusha. But Hashem says, I told you about it. I told you about it. Where did you tell me about it? Where it doesn't appear even one place. Says, says the Gemara in Masechet Chulin, this is the source. We know that there's a Torah Peh, there's, a, there's an oral Torah that is here to explain the written Torah. You would never know how to slaughter an animal if not for the oral Torah, because we never have it written down anywhere besides for the fact that it was transmitted from teacher to student, starting with HaKadosh Baruch Hu to Moshe Rabbeinu, transmitted all the way down till this very day. That's how we know how you're supposed to slaughter an animal. We would never know about tefillin. We would never know that tefillin are boxes of leather that, that you have to work in a certain way and write parchment and put the parchment, what's the order of the parchment and what has to be there? Does it, is it black? Is it squared? Is it blue? Is it an I love you sign? It says, You shall write them. You shall tie them on your arms. You should put them in between your eyes. That's why the Karaim, for many generations, put the tefillin literally between your eye, their eyes. They would put it right here in between their eyes because it says to do it between their eyes. So the, the Chachamim asked them, Put what between your eyes? W what is it? It says put them between your eyes. So we know that it's supposed to be over here by the hairline, above the hairline, right? It shouldn't dip below. A lot of people mess that up. But it's important for us to realize that it says between your eyes. So they said, well, it says, you have, they said, it says you have to put it between your eyes. So we're putting it between our eyes. They said, well, what do you put between your eyes? You don't even know what to put between your eyes. Maybe it's a circle. Maybe it's blue. Maybe it's purple. Maybe it's an I love you. Maybe it's a big heart. You have no idea what, it, what it's supposed to mean. The only way that you know is based on the Torah Shabbat Peh. And in as much as the, as the oral Torah, the Torah Shabbat Peh tells us what it should be, it also tells us that when it says in between your eyes, it means above the hairline, not in between your eyes, literally. And many, many, many such instances 
But it's so important for us to be aware of the primes, the importance of the oral Torah. The Rambam explains in his introduction to his book, Mishneh Torah, he gives you a list of every rabbi and student all the way back from Moshe Rabbeinu, all the way till the end of the Talmud, to show that the transmission of the Talmud was uninterrupted. The transmission of the oral Torah was uninterrupted. And it's so important for people to never, God forbid, mess up this concept because God forbid if they do, it would be considered kfira. Just a beautiful point from the Balaturim, Ka'asher tziviticha, Hashem says, like I commanded you to. It says, Ro v'chad says the Balaturim, the gematria of Ka'asher tziviticha is 1057, 1057. He says, if you do the gematria of the halacha of shechita, which is that by a bird, you must slaughter one, the majority, at least the majority of one of the two pipes, either the food pipe or the wind pipe. And by a, a larger animal, it has to be the majority of both the food pipe and the wind pipe. The way to say that in Hebrew is rov echad be'of, verov shnaim be'hema. He says, if you do the gematria of that, you'll get 1,051 plus the six words that it takes to say that, it's called im hakolel, gets you to 1,057, the same thing. So again, it's another halacha that simply does not appear in the Torah. You will never find this halacha anywhere. But says the Balaturim, in the words, Ka'asher Tziviticha, like what I told you, is this halacha. It's the same gematria. But how do we know that halacha? Only from the oral Torah. Only from the oral Torah. Because the oral Torah is just as important as the written Torah, one could not survive without the other. And it's very important that we understand that. I want to leave you um, with, this, uh, with this thought. Thank you very much for joining us. I wish you all a Shabbat Shalom and only good news for all of Klal Yisrael. Chazakim Abuchim.